So around this time, about a year ago, I was excited. I was elated. I was, <laughs> I was ready for my favorite book to have a brand new adaptation. And, and it all turned out really well, the end, happily ever after. Yeah, it didn't. No? Yeah. No? Not, well, that's not, a shame. Not for me. So, welcome back to Regency Rumors. Today, we are going to be reviewing that version of Persuasion. A moment of silence, everyone. <laughs> silence! So, um, for those of you who don't know, that version of Persuasion is the... 2022 version so it came out about a year ago and i i got one of those like photo notifications where it's like oh remember what you were doing this time last year and it reminded me that that film came out um i think it was this week um last year and so i had a little bit of a thought i was wondering whether or not back when it first came out whether we were all being a bit too harsh on persuasion so i thought a year on maybe i was being unfair on this film and i thought it would be a unique thing to bring on a jane austen newbie you can give kind of your unbiased opinion of the film whereas i've got a lot of like emotional attachments to watching it as a as a teenager and reading yeah. it and things and so you can bring in a separate opinion of like just as a viewer what do you think about this film and is is the backlash mm. that it got warranted um in terms of the things that i liked about it though is that it had a slight connection to uh, the Navy. Military history. The, the military history. That is kind of something that I typically pay a little bit more attention to. I know very stereotypically male of me. I apologize. But but no, I think the Navy has always held a bit of a kind of a point of interest for me um, from that time period anyway. So I think that was an interesting aspect. It didn't go too far into it. But um, one of the things that I definitely remember us talking about when I was reading um, was just some of the perceptions of uh, the Navy officers. I thought that was quite interesting. And I think, yeah, I would say it's with some regularity that Austin will have military men involved with... Yeah, Pride and Prejudice. Yeah, with the stories. And so I always found that quite interesting, really, because obviously that's kind of a key um, aspect of society at the time and um, in terms of the, uh, the upper class and, and the middle class and things like that. So, yeah, quite interesting. Persuasion is this... It's this book of, like, the old world with the new. Um, okay. And comes from this old family who has financial woes um, and her father is is titled and Wentworth is a representation of kind of a new society where people in the, the military or trade can make a good amount of money and be on par with the nobility in society and you can kind of see that friction in her father and her family about mm. her being with a man in, in the military who doesn't have a, a title or comes from a long lineage. Her indigo up picking him anyways like, spoilers yeah, oh, <laughs> sp spoilers for a, what a 300 year old book <laughs> yeah i don't think it counts does it <laughs> no. i think the statute of limitations on spoilers has run out and um being a, a quite a mature measured character that is something that is noticeable even to kind of a, uh, a regency newbie in terms of, of reading uh, the Regency kind of novels, I think that is obvious. A very different reaction to events than Kathy from Wuthering Heights. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah, I think I think that was I think it's a good representation of of a slightly different aspect of society than we would see in, say, Bridgerton and other kind of more dramatized. Yeah, yeah. So this video is a more fun kind of seeing how you feel about persuasion, seeing how yep. I feel about persuasion after a year. Um, but if you would like a more kind of in-depth, period drama heavy video, then I recorded a reaction video of the 2022 persuasion with my friend Charlotte. And I will link that video as well, because we kind of really, as, as two period drama people, we really nerd out um, on it. So it'll be a different, a different video. So if you're, if you're Hot wanting, a, yeah, so if you're wanting a bit more, a heavy discussion on other period dramas and other Austin adaptations, then that is the video for you. So I will link to her uh, channel for that video. So first we're going to talk about the, the book versus the film. So were were you expecting like at the beginning? Okay. Were you expecting for it to be a comedy? No, to have borrowed the stylistic trappings of a modern comedy in the period drama was a choice. <laughs> 
Um, it was definitely interesting. I think you have to use that kind of fourth, breaking of the fourth wall very sparingly. You have to really know what you're doing with it. I agree completely. You need to know what you're doing before you do it, right? It's one of those very old adages, you've got to know the rules before you can break them. <sighs> I, this is not, I think, an instance that I can say with certainty that it wasn't good. And I know that you feel that it wasn't good, probably primarily because of that exposure to the other versions and because the book is one of your favourite books. I mean, I, I could see what they were trying to do. It was, it was a blend of the modern with the historical. They were trying to reach a modern audience. And let's be fair, it's Netflix. They know who their audience is. I think they were definitely trying to appeal to a digital audience yes. um, really quickly that there are people that really enjoyed this adaptation. And I know what it's like to watch a period drama, especially if it's the first version that you've watched of it. Mm -hmm. And that's the one you attach to and love. Yes. For me, it was the 2005 Pride and Prejudice. And there's a lot of kind of BBC purists that are like, oh, that adaptation is horrible and yada, yada, yada. So I know that there are people that feel that way about this persuasion. I just want to say, uh, I'm not trying to put the film down to say like, you're you're wrong and you know this is horrible it is just a film it's a fun film and um there's people that are going to enjoy it and people that aren't and it's completely fine if you love it and think it's amazing i just personally do not and that's okay we can have different views on it but I, i'm not we're not taking this as like uh, i i feel like hey don't drag me in this with you <laughs> I, Look, if you're going to leave comments, leave them about her. <laughs> no, I, I think, you know, it's not a my view, my way or the highway type no, thing. Yeah. Um, so if you enjoyed it and you thought that it was funny and comedic, then that is awesome. I didn't understand the humor or why Persuasion was picked to be a... A vehicle for it. Yeah, a vehicle for as a rom-com. Exactly. I think, and that's something we haven't even talked about yet, is that it, it was rom-com in flavor. Yeah. As opposed to period drama in flavor and romance, um, which is, I think, obviously was a, a, a deliberate stylistic choice that the, the film creator made. I wasn't huge on the whole Bridget Jones flea bag thing of this because it didn't fit Anne Elliot's character. Um, I think Bridget Jones really works as an adaptation of Pride and Prejudice because you can see... Wait, is that what that is? Yes. We'll discuss that later. Yes, it is an adaptation of, uh, a modern adaptation of Pride and Prejudice. But you can see Colin Firth literally plays Mark Darcy in Bridget Jones. And he also plays Mr. Darcy in the 1995 Pride and Prejudice. So it is That's a... just because there's like a very small pool of British actors <laughs> and then they just get reused over and over no, and over No, I again. think they deliberately wanted him to play a version of... Of That's hilarious. A character he played before, yeah. For I sure. genuinely did not know that. <laughs> bless your heart. Don't bless my heart. Excuse me. But because you could see layers of Elizabeth Bennet in Bridget Jones, it made sense, and the the jump was quite easy. You could you could see mm. those parallels in Elizabeth Bennet and in the Darcys. Also, because they decided to make it modern, it was a lot easier to understand the comedy and to put her into situations that modern women could relate to. You know, Bridget Jones is a little bit of a, a mess. She's a little bumbly. She sometimes is hung over. She has a complicated love life, jobs that she struggles with, which are all things that modern women struggle with. What Persuasion tried to do is take Bridget Jones and put her in Persuasion when Anne Elliot is not a, a Bridget jones yeah and w what the result of that is i think is that they were sending a message of like well Anne elliott's a woman in her 20s of course she's gonna be a mess she's drinking and getting drunk at you know parties and getting stuff on her clothes and like she's a clumsy woman in her 20s and all women are like that i think people are much more accepting of of themselves and their their flaws and their growth and things and i don't think it's necessary to be like Anne elliott's just a mess but I think it also didn't really match the character from what we were saying earlier. Quite a mature character who was a little bit more reserved than most yes. in this kind of a story. And yet 
there were moments in the film that were a little bit over the top. For example, opening the window and shouting out of it, jumping down and then pouring a bunch of gravy on her head. Like that was a bit odd. Almost like a teen drama. Yeah. At, in terms of level of, of moments that happened, which was a little, it was a little strange. Um, In terms of the, the modern aspect, there was one thing that I did not like um, purely for what it was and not because of any kind of other hang up, um, which was putting a, a, a sad smiley face on a letter. I think it's just that the it, it didn't land. It the joke those kind of modern modern jokes of like putting emojis on things or when she said, um, oh, he made me a playlist. I just oh, I just think those a things playlist. It didn't it didn't land because if they had have come out of the gate and said, you know, this is this is a period drama, but we're going to have all the language in it be modern reference modern things maybe make it like a knight's tale type oh you preempted me i was going to say that because because of all of the um historical films that have got creative anachronisms in it that work a knight's tale does it so well yes but but why did it do well and i think the key thing is that it didn't draw too much attention to the things that it was doing differently or rather it didn't play them in isolation for a laugh that then didn't land so um in a knight's tale the opening scene is uh, queens we will rock you or the, we are the champions whichever one it was um and um that you know it's played very straight the whole audience is stamping along and clapping to it right whereas in persuasion uh, 2022 there's a there's a note with a smiley face on it with really big eyes and a just a upside down frown. And I'm like, oh, that's just a bit weird. Um, I I feel like because they wanted they wanted to pretend like the modern things weren't there in like that that they that you were supposed to accept that it was uh, in the Regency period rather than like you said where people in scene were were clapping to yeah. modern music. Then I I felt like because we were switching in and out of kind of historical speech and modern speech, it took you out of the scene. Exactly, it just drags you straight out. It yeah, uh, the scene where she was talking about like I'm a four or whatever, and he's a ten. Oh, or, rating. It it immediately mm. took me out of the historical setting, and I was like, oh, completely. Yeah, and but not only that is that it was just cringy. It, yeah, it's it, cringy. It's not. There are times that you can put slightly more modern things in in historical things and do it and do it well in a seamless way that you know you can kind of you go oh I see what they've done there that's you know humorous we'll kind of let it slide but these things were played for laughs so blatantly and then they fell down and I think that's just that's the cringiest part and I, I, I hate hate cringy cringy things I should have filmed you to put it in this film he stepped out of this film three times three times he he was like i can't i can't and like walked into another room i was like we have got to finish this film get back in here and he was like nope nope just 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 let it pass just let it pass i was like finish, finish I was like, the film i was like press play and i'll be back in in a moment <laughs> so yeah in basic terms i think taking the book of persuasion and then choosing for that one to be the one that is a rom-com personally i think that was the wrong choice it hmm. it works really well with books like pride and prejudice because you have comedic moments with characters like mr collins or like well, miss bennett i was gonna say even the mother the right? mother you you have these moments that go really well with with comedy and, and especially with emma you know they adapted yes, emma into yeah. clueless which is always a classic so i feel like persuasion was not one of those to to do that in there, there was it wasn't necessary and so that that book to film adaptation i think made it clunky i think but the problem here is is that We've mentioned a couple of genuine modern adaptations, Bridget Jones, and you just mentioned another one, mm. um, Clueless. Yeah, Clueless. Those are those are actual modern adaptations, whereas this wasn't. This was a, a blending of the two. Um, if they did actually take Persuasion, literally transposed it into 21st century Britain, I think it would have been quite different, and it could have worked. I think if if it if they'd have done it. As a modern adaptation, it would have been one of those like indie romance, yeah, like 
once or something. I was j- look <laughs> this. We're very on sync today. Um, I was literally thinking of once as soon as you said that. I think that look at us. Yeah. Um. It it would have you could have had the same vibe. Um, because it, you know British rom rom coms like that, I mm. think they do they do have that vibe that, that would have worked. But hey ho, alas, we live and we learn. Um, but we didn't make it, so that's okay. Um, and also, if we did try to make it, we probably wouldn't have done as good a job as that anyway. You know, it's making things is hard. So making I, things is hard. I don't want to judge too harshly in terms of the director had a vision, and she she probably. In the same way a lot of us Jane Austen fans do, had a very close connection to Persuasion in some way. And this is her vision of how she wanted to see it play out in a film. So, hmm. so I mean, and, and let's be fair, in terms of that kind of modern flavor, I kind of like characters that do that often. Um, and we've seen it quite successfully in other films recently and the one that comes yeah little women but um even outside of the the regency uh, or sorry period drama genre as well is like deadpool one of the Mm. one of the biggest kind of knockout successes of the past five ten years or whatever with obviously ryan reynolds was this fourth wall breaking character and breaking the fourth wall is something that modern audiences at least seem to enjoy because those things kind of do quite well so one of the other things that we did point out a couple of times when we were watching were moments where the the writer seemed to add a scene or a line of dialogue that kind of assumed that the audience was dumb. And this is one of my biggest pet peeves. Do not like it. Your audience is smart. They will get it. To, to have these overt moments where the characters say really weird things are so... I don't even know which character was what. one of the younger sisters. Louisa. Okay, Louisa says to Anne, is it true that when a woman speaks, he actually listens? Yes, that's what she says. And you're kind of like, wait, what? what, what why is that? Wh- Such what's going a on here? Random... So in, in writing parlance, that is um, telling, not showing. And it's, it's a shorthand. You have your characters do something overtly as opposed to doing it, having an implied action towards it that your audience will figure out. And so in this instance, I think it was just too overt. And there was a couple of instances, I can't remember all of them uh, off the top of my head, but yeah, there were just a few things where we kind of went, oh, come on, we're smarter than that. Um, there's a lot of things that will people will talk about where, you know, modern audiences, are they, they don't have an attention span or, you know, they're not as intelligent or something daft like that. And it's not true. Um, I think it's a shame when media creators think that they have to do that in order to meet an audience that is actually up here. And they're, they're coming down here because that's where they think the audience is because they're being told that it's a bit odd. Well, I think there's a difference between making period dramas accessible to uh, a bunch of different audiences or people that maybe haven't been exposed to period dramas before. So we're not suggesting that they have lofty language no. in persuasion that, that you know, people can't understand. I think a good example of a well-written period drama that's come out recently is Little Women. They've put enough, like, modern language in it for people to understand, mm. but it's not dumbed down. I think with persuasion, I don't really know what was going on there but the writer wanted for a lot of the characters to say the in inside part out loud which isn't necessary if jane austen did a good job at making it in the first instance then yeah put your own spin on it absolutely but to expect that audiences aren't going to understand the plot or that you need for the characters to say what their motivations are out loud all the time i think it just takes you out of out of the scene again it's a it's presuming that your audience isn't going to get it one of the things that's bothered a lot of jane austen fans is they're like was it not enough just to appeal to us like did you have to feel like that you needed to appeal to a new audience that didn't know jane austen and like i was saying before absolutely make something accessible to where you you create a new generation of audiences that you never have before and you know that's that's why i think they they keep making you know star wars and they want to put things in that new audiences are going to be excited about so absolutely make 
you know, new adaptations of appeal to a new audience. However, with stuff like period dramas, it feels as if Hollywood or whatever don't expect that there's enough fans out there. And so they they either don't fund these projects or they have to do something quirky with it and different when in reality loads of loads and loads of people know about Jane Austen like why mm. wouldn't a director treat the Jane Austen fandom like Star Wars would treat a Star Wars fandom like i, I get that there's there's you know Star it, Wars is way bigger than something like Jane Austen but but it is she is mm. a global writer that people have read generation after generation and to treat it as if it needs to be something completely new and then to dumb down the language to change it to a rom-com to make mm. all of these massive changes as if to appeal to people on tiktok rather than just like the fans who know and love the story it it is a bit I mean, irking to me to not to kind of simplify it too much but because of the patriarchy <laughs> uh you know star wars had a, a male audience that typically gets a lot more attention from the studio executives than uh, typically female audience genres and or media properties uh, you know that's probably possibly probably part of it and i think the whole getting a new audience thing is is hard isn't it because as you say there are there will be some younger people out there who've not seen the older versions who will see this with its um clean um crisp hd filming and the the kind of the sound and the the kind of the slightly more modern feel and then they will like it and they will always like it more than the other ones which they see as old and outdated and, Absolutely. and that's fine you're, and it's something right. that you know you're always going to get those and i think we're just we're in a time period now where so many things are being made and remade for audiences that already exist as well as these new upcoming audience that we slightly older folk <laughs> get a little bit grumpy when it doesn't fully match our expectations and we see this with everything you know you see you see it with literally every media franchise out there i think it's probably just part of the the circle of life <laughs> and maybe it's a case of the more adaptations that are made of things like jane austen the more people will be used to it i think a good mm. example of that is shakespeare shakespeare is redone in a million different ways modern shakespeare or punk rock shakespeare like you can have so many different adaptations and styles of Shakespeare and people are used to that because they've been doing it for a really long time and so people don't really get up in arms about different versions of Shakespeare because we're well educated enough in the original that no one's thinking that Sha anything with Shakespeare is being taken away because the originals are still there they've been on the stage for a really long time hmm. people are mostly aware of what the original stories are or at least kind of the cliff notes of them and so i think people don't get as much up in arms as they do with other adaptations and maybe you know two three hundred years from now it'll be different and people will be like there's been a million jane austen adaptations and you know jane austen in space and you oh, know i'm gonna write it jane austen and oh what what was it that i sent you the the other day there was one that was pride and prejudice in space yeah and then there is a whole series of pride and prejudice and dragons where there's dragons ah. in pride <laughs> so like yes. you know the the more that people adapt things um the more people will will be used to them so we're, we're just kind of looking at this film with a little bit of a critical eye because it's fun but i mean i'm all down for for a, a bunch of different types of jane austen adaptations the crazy the kooky and the fun so yeah yeah and i'm not even lying when i have said what i've thought and you know what adapting this to science fiction or fantasy would be really fun um just as an exercise of of a writing exercise you know it would be amusing um well there's a lot out there there's a lot of uh jane austen adaptations so you should look them up and see if there's any that would appeal Make to you my millions <laughs> so now we're going to talk about the characters of Anne elliot and captain wentworth why are you saying it like that well oh dear i feel like they didn't have a lot of chemistry in this oh shocker i'm not gonna like blame the actors for that i think that comes down to her character was so altered i i think they 
they kept a more traditional Wentworth in this, but her character was so altered that maybe that could be the reason why I personally didn't think they had a lot of chemistry. But just kind of starting out on the notes that I have here, I put that Anne Elliot has what I call the Hillary Duff effect. Hillary Duff is queen. Uh, but in the early 2000s, okay. uh, Hillary Duff was in a lot of uh, teen films where she was the nerd in the school or she was the mm. ugly duckling or whatever. Oh, yes, the ugly one. The ugly one, right? <laughs> she she would be the person that would be bullied or be made fun of. You know, in like a Cinderella story, she had a stepmom who was mean to her type thing. Everyone knew that Hillary Duff was the prettiest person, like objectively, on the screen. And so it's this very weird effect where things are happening to the main character that don't match up with reality. And it happened a lot in, in Hilary Duff films, but it's it's in this persuasion as well mm. where it's kind of clear that Dakota Johnson is, they've intentionally, in these scenes with her her family, with her father, with her kind of plain looking sister that they haven't put any makeup on, like she is the prettiest person in that room. They they intentionally have made that so, but then everybody around her is like, oh, too bad we couldn't say anything nice about you because you're so bland, you know, and it doesn't match up with reality. So you're kind of looking at it being like, okay, well, everybody around her is being like, mm, sorry that your life is sad and that you're not as cool as we are and that you're ugly when we can see that she's the prettiest person there. And so it, it, those sorts of things don't match up and it's a mm. very kind of teen drama thing to do. Because you, your main character can't be ugly, but then the story needs them to be. I think where this this version doesn't line up and make sense is that Anne is very snarky. And so she goes around pretty much the whole film criticizing her family, saying negative things about her sisters and her dad and even Wentworth at times, uh, Mr. Elliot. Like, she is snarky about everything. And it's it's not to say that what she's saying isn't, isn't reality around her. Like, clearly her dad is self-obsessed and her sister is a hypochondriac and things like that. But the way that she says things makes you think, well, she's just another snarky person in this. Mm -hmm. And so it's really hard for us to go, oh, we can see why Wentworth is in love with her because like what she's doing isn't matching up with realities. If we as an audience don't like her character, why would Wentworth like her character? Like it doesn't, it because doesn't make sense. Because the story tells him to. Mm -hmm. So, but I mean, but that is part of what we were saying before in, in that when you make some of the kind of modern changes, you've got to make all of them or none of them. Because if you make some of them, then some of the rest doesn't make sense. Because I mean, that, yeah, yeah that, that's a generalization. But yeah, yeah. I no, mean, yeah. Because, because like in this instance, we're talking about the kind of the snarkiness of, mm -hmm. of the main character, which is quite common in more modern media at the minute. Mm -hmm. um, and so to have... And to have the internal thoughts breaking yeah. the fourth wall. Yeah. So that only really works with a snarky character. Um, and so that only adding that element then makes the rest of it difficult to kind of fit together in, in its jigsaw. Yeah, to make it then persuasion again without it being a bit clunky. Yeah, yeah. because because that one piece that you've changed now doesn't fit with the rest of them exactly. So Yeah, so I, I think that changing of her character to make her a lot more um snarky and really negative about everybody around her. It's not that it's not that in persuasion Anne doesn't notice those things about her family. I think Jane Austen's Anne wouldn't have responded or communicated that to the audience in the same way that this film has made Anne talk about her family and love interests because Anne is not an Emma Anne is not an Emma yeah that should just be the title of this that you know we've we've said it we're, we're done with the with the podcast now goodbye <laughs> so one thing that we did mention a couple of times um throughout the film that was obviously a major plot point but then was elided was the fact that Anne is a spinster which you know, these days has a slightly different connotation, but a spinster obviously being a, a woman above marrying age who is not married. Um, she was the shocking age of 27. Oh, no. How dare her be that um, old? Yeah. Oof. Shocking. And um, so, yeah, at 27 being unmarried, obviously being 
pretty negative thing in in the time period um labels her as a spinster as opposed to a, an eligible bachelorette or whatever it is that they genuinely call them i don't think i don't think they mentioned I her age once i don't remember if they mentioned that but they definitely didn't highlight that which i think took away a lot of the barriers for why her and captain wentworth couldn't be together you know i th- i think that there was this assumption for the people around and that she wasn't eligible for him that's why they're like oh do you think she, you know captain wentworth will want louisa or Hen- henrietta like they don't mention her because yeah. of her age and in this it doesn't it doesn't make any sense why she wouldn't be considered a um potential marriage partner for him if the age it takes away a barrier except that they did add a barrier in this version um one that we didn't really accept as being acceptable yeah um but if you remember they added the (laughs) the very modern line early on like now he's my ex yeah (laughs) and so the only reason that they couldn't be together is because they were exes and therefore you know too awkward to go get back together or something you know basically like this whole situation ship thing and online dating thing and two people not communicating properly or like not defining the relationship i definitely felt like they were trying to paint tones of that in into this this is definitely one of those stories where there would be no story if people just genuinely talked to one another he gets so mad at that period dramas do have a tendency to sometimes have a huge plot point uh, be pending on two people that could just talk to each other you know so. instead of <laughs> instead of being all angsty and leaving a little note on the table explaining <laughs> your your long lost love the best love letter it wasn't though ever written but it wasn't we're talking about the film version so you, now. are you are you gonna write me a better than that probably that not probably not um so but you know like instead of instead of just saying look um it's been seven seven years since i've seen you um but i'm still madly in love with you you know you could tell that she was still sing- single like if if that's what he th- like there was no actual genuine reason for either of them to not say something yeah in the book as well oh no yes oh <sighs> um Oh, I can't, I can't marry you because I'm simply a navy man. What? The him, him coming back. The, what was the reason? He didn't have enough money at the, the time. But, when but they he were did. Younger. I'm not talking about when oh, they were younger. When he came back. When he, when he, well, it'd been seven years. Like so? they barely knew each other. So again. So. If if you and so? I were dating and then we stopped dating and then for seven so? years we didn't talk and then we talked after seven years, do you think immediately we would get together? If we were burning with passion in the same way that Wentworth and Anne were, then yes, I submit that we would. Mm. Case closed, Your Honor. <laughs> um. Um. No, I mean, yeah, I know they they needed to talk and stuff, but again, but they didn't. They just they 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 talked a they, lot for. What was that? That well, that was them being like, "Oh, I, I don't want to, but I do," and I, like, "I can't," and like, <laughs> I feel like they talked more in this one than a typical period drama, which to me, like when when they met on the beach and they were like professing how they felt, yes. but then he was like, "I want us to be friends." I really, I really <laughs> yeah. feel like one of my favorite things about Austin is that she creates that tension. You know, um, they don't know how they feel about each other. And because of the time period, they couldn't really talk about those things anyways. And so that creates that tension in a lot of um, romances that people take from that formula today. Mm -hmm. And so taking that away and just letting them be able to, to talk openly when they want to, but then them just not deciding to talk openly, it takes... It takes away that tension, and so I wasn't. I didn't really care whether or not they got together at the end because I was like, "Well, you know, they've said all they've had to say a couple times in this at this point." So I don't know. It was a foregone conclusion. Um, 
So one of the things I caught in this that I didn't catch the first time around that has made my blood boil. Oh. Wentworth and Louisa are talking in the woods and Anne kind of comes upon them talking. Mm. He basically, he overtly says like, oh, um, don't let Anne fool you. Like her, her family's prideful, but she's the worst of them kind of thing. We're like, you know, her family might be that way, but she's just as bad as the rest of them, which I guess in terms of the way they've made this character, that's true. Like it, it is a true statement for him to say that because mm. the way that they've set up this character, well, yeah, mm. she's just as bad as the rest of them because we know her inner thoughts. However, to make a Jane Austen hero talk about his love interest to another woman and behind her back so overtly like that, like that, that is a red flag in modern times. Like if you were to go, yeah, raising the red flag, if you were to go and talk to a, a, another woman about your problems in our marriage or something like that would be a, a red because i got so many <laughs> that would be a red flag like and and especially in dating you know that there's that saying of if they'll talk to you they'll talk about you you know like if they'll talk to oh, you about okay, somebody else mm. they'll talk about you but to have a jane austen hero basically um talk badly about her to another woman like it's naughty naughty it's badly done emma badly done so one of the other things in terms of um, characters coming out and saying it outright is that the the main antagonist of, uh, what was his name? Mr. Elliot. Yep, that's the one. Um, he, um, he came out, he laid his cards out on the table, didn't he? Um, and he, he overtly told Anne what it was that he was doing. Yeah, his motivations. Partway through I the film. I was flabbergasted. I think at their second meeting, he says... His entire motivations of like, I'm trying to keep your dad away from this woman that I think he wants to marry because I don't want him to have kids and have an heir. And so um, I'm trying to pursue her instead. And like, also you. Yeah, it was, it was a little <laughs> really odd. weird. So it would be like you watching, you know, an Agatha Christie Perot Miss Marple murder mystery and halfway through the killer being like, I did it. And this is how I did it. And this is why I did it. So yeah, now now go solve it. <laughs> it kind of it's gone back into that rom com territory where the the tension and the conflict of the story isn't you know these other plot elements. It's just will they get together? Yeah, which is a bit of a shame. It kind of reduces it down to its barest elements or basest elements. I also feel like based on what we were talking about about Anne's character being altered in this and her being snarky and everything mm. um i feel like her and mr elliot had more chemistry in this than her and miss her and miss her and captain wentworth did i think more they were common. more in mm. common i felt like the two of them could kind of volley off of each other yes. and you know i i quite enjoy having that in a in a relationship we we enjoy kind of being snarky to one another like in a fun way you know it's it's a bit of like flirting and, and what we? the Brits call banter. Oh, no, don't do that. <laughs> oh. But, it, you know, it. I, I think especially for couples that have been married a long time, like it's it's fun to kind of poke at each other um, as as long as it's all, you know, always joking, which ours always is. Mm -hmm. But like it's a fun thing in the dynamic of a relationship. Whereas Captain Wentworth and the depiction of, of that character in this was nothing like that. I feel like because Austin created both Wentworth and Anne to be kind of measured, level-headed people, they work together in the book, whereas this, it feels like they would clash a bit more. Or like why, if Wentworth is that type who is who is more measured and level-headed, why would he want to be with Anne who is not those things in this? It's a bit more spiky. Yeah. Not to mm. say that those things are... are bad it's it's just it doesn't match well, just, up with they didn't the match. original story mm. so anywho i will talk about a positive really quickly because um it's not all negative even though we have been a little bit negative i really liked this version of her sister mary 
this is my favorite version of Mary, which is shocking. All of the other adaptations of Mary are kind of matronly where she's mm. older and like, oh, I'm sick all of the time. Older, frumpy type. Isn't she specifically the youngest sister, though? Is it Elizabeth the oldest? Mary's the youngest and then and Anne's, Anne's the middle. middle. You could be right. And see, that's that's interesting because then why did those other versions play this character as if she was like this old matronly, you know, a hypochondriac? Where this mm. this makes way more sense for her sister to be younger and be like, I don't know where my kids are. And like, I'm trying to do self-care, like very self-centered and the, the whole hypochondriac thing comes from the self-centeredness of her her poor nerves like oh my gosh and it i i think that translates really well into you know the whole trope of today with kids being in their phones or um everybody being obsessed with themselves or thinking that they're the main character of their own story mary is a great representation of that and i think they did a good job with this character, I think, had they decided to do a modern adaptation and stuck her in there with the whole talk about self-care and, like, her saying she's an empath, even though that's clearly not what she is, like, that would translate so well into a modern adaptation. Yeah, that character you could just pick up and, and plop in a, yeah. a modern version and it would work. So I, th that was my favorite version of Mary that they've um, ever done. And I, I think that the actress was really funny and... In, in terms of laughs in this mm. very bizarre film, I think that one, that character is what made me laugh the most. So, what are your final thoughts on Persuasion 2022? Other than the cringy parts, which I hate. Um, you mean you didn't love that scene where she randomly talked about having an octopus sucking her face? Oh, no. Oh, that, was so, oh, that was the worst. I, yeah, I'd blocked that out. Thank you for reminding me. Oh, I, I just thought I would, uh, you know. <sighs> but I'm nightmares. Um, so, no, yeah, other than the cringy parts, I, I thought it was fine. Um, it's not, like, completely it, uh, unwatchable. Yeah, I mean, we, I didn't turn it off partway through. I'm, I mean, I'm trying not to be too negative because, like, yeah. I don't, I feel I don't, it doesn't deserve complete negativity. Um, but I, I didn't like it as much as Emma. Yeah, the the new Emma. The new Emma. Yeah. Didn't like it as much as that. Um or the newest little women. I feel like the problem with this persuasion is it's not amazing enough to say like, oh, this is going to be a new classic period drama, but it's not bad enough to be like this is going to be a cult classic. And that's the that's sad because mediocre. But may maybe it will be a cult classic in maybe. 20 years. You never know. Yeah. Whereas I think that the newest Emma, in my opinion, is good enough that it will be liked for quite a while. I agree. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Justice for the Sarah Snook version that never was. Um, That was supposed to be a more serious version. And when they found out that this persuasion was being made, they went, mm, no, and they axed it. Because they're like, well, oh. why would two persuasions come out at the same time? So they axed that version. And now mm. may maybe because this one wasn't well received, they'll pick that back up. Who knows? Doubt it. But I w we'll watch it. You make it. We'll watch it. She'll watch it. And then I'll potentially watch it. I'll watch it. And then I'll make him watch it. Oh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> fine. Thank you so much for following along with our rants to do with persuasion. It wasn't a rant. It was a discussion. Yes. The discussion of persuasion. Uh, please like and subscribe we're a very new very small channel on youtube so we would very much appreciate if you would do what what do they say the youtube stuff like subscribe comment so yeah <laughs> remember how i just said i don't like cringy things <laughs>